I think something you were talking about, and it sort of reminded me of this chart that I, it was, this is from YouGov. YouGov is a polling site. And they did a study. Let me see if I can put us in a better place here. So it's a little bit bigger. Cool. So they did a study. Uh, are electric cars better for the environment than gas cars? Uh, most Democrats say yes, but not Republicans. Another one, I, I want to look at it from like a partisan perspective. I want to look at it all U.S. adult citizens. I think what's really interesting here. So of all the people that they polled, so there's three categories. So there's five categories total. The top two categories are better for the environment, more energy efficient. The purple is electric cars. So a majority of uh, U.S. adult citizens think that EVs are better for the environment and more energy efficient or no difference, a large majority. But where, what I find extremely interesting is that uh, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican or whatever. Most people think that uh, gas cars are safer to operate, more affordable to maintain and more reliable. And what, what I find really interesting there. So if I use myself as an, a sort of a, a person, right, from my experience, you know, and I've, I've driven gas cars my whole life up until 2016, is that these three for me <laughs> are significantly more skewed towards EVs. And so, but what I find interesting is that a large majority of the U.S. does not think that's the case. And I think that's, it, it's exactly what you're talking about, Brandon, is that there is this barrier. There is this barrier of either belief or actuality that people don't have that are not uh, either accepting or haven't seen yet. Pull up that chart again. I'll get you into the yes, perception sir. of the, of the non EV, the anti EV, or even the personal defense. So safer to operate when a, a gas car fails for whatever reason, that's not popping up in the news. If, uh, if, uh, if FSD pulls into a crowd of people, that's going to be all over the news. So that's what people are going to see. So that's going to lead to perception of that more affordable to maintain. People are hearing that insurance rates are higher, um, on, on EVs. Uh, they're hearing that, uh, it's crazy expensive to replace a battery. Um, they're hearing that it's, you have to, if it's a Tesla, you can't take it to your local mechanic to get it fixed. You've got to take it to Tesla that costs more money. So there's your perception on that one. Um, and then the liability, uh, I think that goes back into, okay, where can I get it fixed and what's going to happen to it? And just the unknown of, okay, what's the maintenance on it? That kind of stuff. All I think uh, that third thing is going to fit back into the, the first two things that we just talked about. And for whatever reason, there's still a perception by most people that I talk to who aren't in the bubble that they're going to have to replace their battery every 20 to 50,000 miles and that it's going to cost them, you know, four to $10,000 to do that every time. Um, and so, yeah, that's obviously doesn't seem to be true in the case of Tesla. Um, but that that's the perception of a lot of people that I've spoken to on the topic. Right. And this is the barrier. This is the, this is the complication that, uh, that Tesla is going to have to overcome and they're going to have to overcome, overcome it with education. Don't call it advertising. I know Tesla doesn't want to advertise. Don't, don't advertise, throw that money into education budget and then throw that on. Tw no, don't put it on Twitter because everyone on Twitter, they already know what the deal is. Uh, but I mean, throw some, throw some education numbers out there. Say, okay, batteries are rated to last this long. I mean, uh, we've got Tesla's out there with this many miles on it. We, you don't have to take your car in for an oil change ever. Um, there's, there's people out there that don't know that you don't have to get an oil change on a Tesla. There's lots of people. I could guarantee you all the anti EV folk. There's probably 50% of them that don't realize that you don't have to get your oil change with a Tesla. And I, I can tell you somebody like, uh, Someone who doesn't want to go in and deal with a mechanic, that would be the number one selling point to to someone who doesn't have to take off work to go get go get just regular maintenance done on your car. And people don't know that. Tesla needs to spend money on that. For the last couple of years, I was on sort of on the boat that I thought that the that Tesla would be able to overcome a lot of those shortcomings by just focusing on the product and just focusing on affordability and just pushing as many cars as they as they can but i think as time goes on i think what you're talking about and sort of what other people have talked about in the past where tesla has to spend uh resources and, and education and getting people to understand the value proposition it becomes even more important the deeper they go into their production right because i think what's interesting about the the ev story is like for the last 12 months we've seen the the growth of EVs, at least in the in the in the Western world and in the United States, the growth of EVs year over year has come down dramatically because it went from a uh, hundred thousand cars a year 
to whatever, a million cars a year, whatever that number is. So it went through a huge boom, but now there's this sort of plateau that was starting to hit. You know, my argument is, is affordability, but it's also education. It's obvious that education and getting people to transfer to that technology also needs to be there. But like countries like China and everything, that the growth ex keeps going. The, the growth keeps going in those in that country, even though you know the, it's not part of the Western sort of way of we, how we think about transportation. They're booming over there, and eventually they're going to try to sneak in into other countries as well over time, as long as the countries allow them, either you know through through tariffs or whatever. But the the point I'm trying to make here is that. EVs and, and Tesla in particular have been able to grow a lot in the last few years, but now they, they've hit this plateau. Now they're at this point where they have to figure out what is the next stage for them. And it's going to be fascinating to see the next 12 to 12, 24 months as Ford, GM, and everybody else, GM, they, they've scaled back EVs. They're going hard into hybrids now. I'm sure you've seen those those uh, articles, and I've, I saw you cover that as well. They're abandoning EVs in a way. They're delaying it, but in reality, I think the, the, what I'm hearing is shift resources to hybrid because we can't penetrate the EV market for whatever whatever variable they're deciding. Hybrids is in their core expertise. They're able to make money on hybrids. That's the most important part, I believe. They lose a ton of money on EVs. They make a bunch of money on hybrids, and so they're moving over to hybrids. and And the population is also, you know, we have data that shows this, they're not either quite ready for EVs or they don't know that they're ready for EVs. And so they are reacting to the market, whereas a company like Tesla is trying to position itself for what they think that people will want in five to 10 years. And that's the way I'm viewing the market right now. And then we have this whole dynamic right now going on too that you highlighted, Brandon, where there was a post that you put on X that said, this is not just a Tesla problem. So this is a uh, Tesla sales plunge far more than expected. This was from CNN back in April 2nd. This is not just a Tesla problem. Demand is gone for the whole car market. Tesla is going to show it first because of the direct consumer model. Other auto manufacturers to follow as dealers turn down allocations due to lack of demand for all vehicles. Can you expand? on this a little bit because I'm really curious to see what what you're seeing here. Yeah, so so Tesla, you're going to see movements in the market and Tesla is going to be able to foreshadow a lot of these movements because their model is direct to consumer. This is why Tesla is so great, right? Because you don't have to deal with the stupid dealers and stupid market adjustments, add-ons, all the BS that they want to put on these cars. It's a great thing, but it also means that um they're going to be able to show sales declines or sales booms, uh, depending on the direction of the economy, depending on people have money to spend. Now, I mean, we have to take that with a grain of salt because Tesla might not be what the whole market experiences because they're in the EVs. But my expectation from the market is that the rest of the market is going to follow suit with what Tesla is putting out because Tesla is big enough for the mainstream buyer now that they're going to be able to show the ebbs and flows of the of the market. And we've already seen that, okay, um, Stellantis, their sales are down. They came out two days after uh, Tesla's deliveries uh, missed. And they're 10% they're down overall. So I, I think this is going to be a theme across the market. And it's an affordability problem. It's a economy problem. It's a it's a just just general people that they're they're holding on to their money right now. They do not want to buy cars, whether it's a Tesla, whether it's a Ford truck, F one fifty, whatever. They're holding on to their money, and we're seeing it at Tesla. We're seeing it that uh, these dealerships are starting to turn out allocations because when you see a company like Stellantis, they come out and say, "Okay, our sales are ten percent down." That's not to consumers. That's to dealers, Stellantis, Ford, GM. They are wholesalers. They're manufacturers. They make vehicles. When they make a sale is when they deliver a vehicle to uh, their, their dealerships. And if dealerships are now turning down allocations to the tune that uh, Stellantis has to um, say that their sales are down 10%, then Stellantis, their dealers were filling it months ago because they're going to fill up their uh, dealer lots. And then at that point, Stellantis is going to find little holes. They're going to channel stuff. They're going to get uh, dealers to move their uh, a lot of their vehicles to service loaners so they can still stuff some more cars in there. And at this point right now, there's no more stuffing left to stuff. So so at, the, at this point, you're going to start seeing these manufacturers um, do have sales that are that are are missing expectations too? That's what we're going to see going forward from Ford, GM, and especially uh, Stellantis. And uh, overall, I don't think it's just a Tesla problem. Or it's it's hitting the whole market right now. 
that's a point that sometimes gets missed that I when, when I see people sort of reacting to the Tesla news because that's you know they they go to the buyer directly the all the other manufacturers have that <laughs> that thing in the middle that they can use to soften their blow I think let me ask you this question since you are since you you've been in the car market for for so long does this does this year feel any different than any other years and, and in what ways if that's the case so one thing that we're experiencing now, and it's, I mean, I just repeat just pretty much what I just said is over the last three years, allocations weren't turned down. Dealers are trying to get their hands on whatever they could get their hands on. They load it up and, and now they count. But what I'm seeing, because I'm a used car dealer, so what I can see is the auction. So I can see kind of the same thing that Tesla sees when it reports its numbers, where I can see that, okay, if dealers are selling vehicles or if they're not, by the amount of trade-ins that I see at the auctions. So when somebody takes in their car to to trade it in, those dealerships, they don't, they don't keep them for the most part. They'll send them directly to auction. So if there are fewer trade-ins at the auction, that means there are fewer deals getting done on the franchise dealer level, meaning that there are, there are I mean, there are fewer new cars that are being sold. We've been seeing that for the last month, month and a half now, and it's it's getting it's getting pretty bad. So, how much of this basically carnage that is in store for the car dealership model, which you know it has served a great purpose up until this point, but moving forward, I I don't see how the the overall car market you know maintains that business model into the next 10, 20 years. How much of the uh, the blame for that do you think is going to be aimed squarely at EVs? I don't. I mean, none of the blame is for for EVs at this point. It's um, the the problem. But do you think in the media, like from a public perception standpoint, are the are the dealers going to squawk about the transition to EVs being part of what it is that's putting them out of business? No, what they're what they're complaining about now. You'll have dealers like like Ford. Ford dealers and Ford are not seeing eye to eye on the EV rollout, and uh, it's that's that's been in the news. We've talked about that quite a bit. But they had to do these big build outs at their franchises to um, to be able to put these Mach E's, these F one fifties there to be able to sell them. And we know they're not selling. They, I mean, Ford can mark down these Mach E's as low as they want to. Still, nobody's buying them. Um, but, uh, I, that's not, that's not the big problem. I feel like where this, the dealership model that you're, you're, I think you're trying to, to get to the big blame from the dealers is going to the manufacturers saying their, their MSRPs are too high. You're giving us the, the, the cars are too expensive. We can't sell them. And then from the manufacturer, they're like, okay, we put too many add-ons and addendums and stuff during, uh, during the last three years, it was your fault then. But uh, now they have to kind of work together because the manufacturer has to give the dealership money to be able to get them to be able to lower their price enough to roll out cars to still make the margins they need to to pay their bills. But uh, where you're talking about like the breakdown of this this kind of dealership model goes away, it doesn't go away. There's so much legislation put in place that the dealership model it can't go away because I mean, it, there's so... I mean, all of the companies that sell to dealerships can absolutely go bankrupt. Like they can't sell cars that don't exist because the companies that create them are driven to bankruptcy. But then where are all the cars coming that, that people are going to go buy? Tesla They'll can't produce come, enough um, to service everyone on the road. It won't be just Tesla. Like there's going to be lots, any new car company. And, you know, it, it can be a company that goes into bankruptcy restructures and comes out and just wipes the slate clean of all their prior engagements like there's going to be a lot of carnage and restructuring that's going to happen moving forward because everything you know this is this is the thing about evs versus ice cars that 99 percent of people just don't understand structurally evs are getting cheaper and cheaper every year and ice companies are getting more and more expensive every year and that's for the simple fact that, you know, we've we've squeezed every last drop of efficiency that we can out of an ICE vehicle. And then there's all these other extra layers on top of it that make it more expensive where we're trying to get more features out of it. We're, you know, our, we've got structures like dealership models that are trying to get more money out of it. And then you've got the the vehicle manufacturers themselves that are being subjected to more and more regulation at the 
both state and, and national and then international levels. And so those things drive costs. And so, you know, that's where the thing just, you know, it breaks. You've got a, a system where things are getting more and more expensive, competing against something where they're getting cheaper and cheaper over time. And so, you know, it's not going to be just Tesla, but there's going to be China is really kicking butt and taking names when it comes to the auto market internationally. That hasn't reached U.S. shores yet, but it's inevitable. And those low cost vehicles, unless we do something crazy with regards to protectionism, um, that I don't even know how we, you know, we couldn't keep the Japanese out, even though we hated them. How are we going to do that to the Chinese if they start building vehicles in Mexico or Canada or other places? And then, you know, the consumer at the end of the day is going to demand vehicles at affordable prices. 